well, why should we not add, say, the Gospel of Thomas to the New Testament or the Gospel of Judas or, well, maybe not that one as a bad example, but maybe some <laughs> other Gospels, about- right? Well, the reason why is because in the early church, they were not widely reading these. There's and a there's- huge difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and any of these other Gospels that you may come across. The four Gospels, as I said, they were circulating in one collection. They were being read by Christians in the West and the East. You can go any corner of Christianity and say the second and third century, fourth century, they're reading these Gospels. They're very popular they recognize that they go back to the apostolic community but other writings that you may hear about today these other gospels gospel of philip they're what you might call sectarian read by the folks who were more on the fringes of christianity so maybe gnostic communities but not uh your typical church not your typical gathering. So, the fact that we had very few copies of these and some of these weren't even discovered until the 1940s, that just that reminds us that these were not very popular in the early church. Had a very limited circulation. So that's a huge difference. So. my friends welcome to another episode from christianpodcast.com my name is beto gudinho and i want to welcome you to today's topic we're going to be talking about creating the canon and i'm not talking about digital cameras i'm talking about the bible i'm talking about where does the bible come from who wrote it why did they write it why so many authors and basically is there a controversy about this book which many people have you know their own opinions about this book is it an authoritative book and why would it be okay so we're gonna discuss that but before we do that let's enjoy the show Ah, I love that music. Benjamin P. Laird. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm great. It's a little warm, but it's, <laughs> it's great. Yeah, life what? is good. It's warm where? I'm in Central Virginia. We don't have wow. uh, the nice dry air like you have out west, so it's just humid. I'm ready for the fall. Yeah. Wow, we just had a hurricane for people listening right now. We had a, a hurricane with a promising name. Okay, I'm not gonna, not gonna say which name, but it was a promising name to be devastating. And all I saw, I come from Mexico, man. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, yeah, it didn't live up to its name. We had mild rain. I've seen worse times in Mexico. And I'm glad because, I mean, we we don't want a hurricane to cause devastation. But that was kind of funny how the media hyped it up to be like, you know, seek refuge and stuff like that. But nonetheless, that's just to kind of like warm us up and kick us off with today's emoji of the day. Okay, so here we go. Let's see. We're going to the Belifo meter. We're going to check out what's the emoji reaction for today's episode. And it's the skeptical emoji. Of course, skeptical emoji. Benjamin, why do you think there's maybe skepticism around the Bible or the canon? Why did you choose that emoji? (laughs) You know, I wish I could raise one eyebrow like that. I can't. I can't do that myself. But it, it kind of, if I could do it, that's uh, that's kind of the look I would give maybe um, here. You know, a lot of people look at the canon, they think about the New Testament, and uh, it's it's one of those things. Everyone has kind of a basic idea of where it came together. At least they think they have an idea. Everybody has an opinion, but uh, a lot of the information is is very obscure. Mm-hmm. And uh, we hear often theories of how the canon came about. And so people hear these theories here and there and kind of patch together their own kind of perspective on this. So there's the, the theories are just so diverse on how the canon came together. And I think unless you're willing to do a lot of digging and uh, really get deep into this, it's really hard to have uh, an informed perspective on these things just so far back, you know, 2000 years ago that the New Testament came together. So. I find canon's one of those things people love to talk about. They they find very interesting, but 
haven't really developed a historical framework for, you know, working through these issues. Wow. There we have it. That's right, my friends. Well, I have your book right here in my hand. It's called Creating the Canon, Composition, Controversy, and the Authority of the New Testament. It's it's a phenomenal, like, it's it's great, great, great book. Has so many insights. I'm loving it. I'm loving reading it and listening to it because it's on Audible, too. And But, I mean, I think that's right. You know what you're saying? There's There's this like why should i subscribe or ascribe or prescribe or whatever to to like the teachings of a book and let alone a book that was formed by who knows who right <laughs> like i mean that's kind of like what you're saying you know it's very obscure yeah. so like yeah. who wrote it first of all and then who decided what was going to be part of the canon and why was that going to be I mean, basically, technically, God's word, right? And if there is a God that's speaking to humans, why doesn't he get to pick which books versus, you know, humans coming together? So, I mean, I, I, I have some questions around there, but let's kick off with that, you know, a little bit about the maybe the composition of the book. I know, I mean, you go in so much detail when you talk about the book, but mm -hmm. um, I guess... Let's focus on New Testament, right? Or maybe can you give us some direction on when we look at the Bible, should we kind of like separate New Testament, like when Jesus comes from from like the, the Jewish tradition of the Old Testament? I think most people are familiar with that, right? Or is that a good place to yeah. start? Yeah, those are all great questions. I'll just uh, say something about uh, skepticism, like you mentioned before. People often are skeptical of the Bible, and it, it really has to do with... Uh, I would say the fact that, uh, kind of like you alluded to, we have these books that didn't just come from heaven, right? They didn't come as a package out of the sky and land in our lap, and uh, you know, as God's gift to us. Instead, He used humans to compose the works, to deliver the works, to copy the works over the centuries. Mm. So there's, I mean, it's inescapable that you have a human element to this. And I think anytime you have a human dimension to things, then people are going to naturally be skeptical of its authority right you know who who says that this guy over here who wrote 2000 years ago no less you know who's to say that he should have some kind of uh say in what i believe and what i think and how i perceive the world and you know even the the selection of the writings if if we have all these writings that were written independently in different places different times and now they're part of one package one canon you know who is in charge of that and then we might just be a little skeptical of their authority right mm -hmm. so i would say the human element is really uh what trips people up they just have a hard time recognizing that these could actually come from god yet mm. but there's a human dimension to it as well it seems like it has to be just one or the other if it didn't fall out of the sky then you know we should maybe raise some questions here about its authority and its uh reliability things like that um mm -hmm. but yeah one of the things i try to do in the book is i try to strike a balance between a lot of the historical questions that people have or should have, I guess you could say, and then also theological questions. So really the first six chapters, they, they really discuss the process, the historical questions people may have. And then the last two questions are geared more at theology. So I, I try to balance the two together. And what I'm trying to argue is just like the doctrine of Christ, when we study Christology, when we try to learn about the nature of Jesus, we come to the conclusion, if you read the Bible and, and take it seriously, you come to the conclusion that he was divine, but he was also human. And you get into trouble when you reject one of the two, right? And throughout church history, there have been some who just really emphasize the humanity of Jesus, but rejected his divinity. People like Arius back in the uh, fourth century. But then you also have uh, some groups over time that have actually embraced his divinity, and they think that to protect his divinity, you have to kind of uh, distance Jesus from his humanity. So we get in trouble when we just uh, choose one or the other. He's the divine man, and that's what the mystery of the incarnation is all about with Jesus. And I would say there's there's a similar analogy there with uh, the New Testament writings. The writings of Scripture, they're divine. They're inspired as we read in Scripture and as, as we even find in our own lives as we live out these truths. But uh, they're they're not just of divine origin. They're all, there's also a, a human dimension to this. And so I try to walk people through, you know, how did the New Testament come together? 
when someone like Paul tried to write a book, when he determined to do that, what did what was involved with that? You know, what 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 were the steps he had to take to uh, get his thoughts uh, on paper and then get it to the intended reader? So we start with composition, and then we talk about in the what, what would that be? The fourth, fifth, and sixth chapters. We talk about the process of canonization. That is, after the writings are composed and they began to circulate, how do we have these twenty-seven specific writings come together? and form one collection uh, that we call the New Testament today. So those are some of the major things I look at. Uh, but yeah, to kind of go back to the specific questions you mentioned about composition, uh, we find that uh, one of the things I mentioned in the book is that uh, we find in the early church around first, second century that writing often involved a lot of people. And mm -hmm. we often have in our minds that, uh, you know, someone like Paul would have kind of sequestered himself in a private place and, you know, if he's going to write something like Romans, he wants to kind of, you know, get out of the public eye for a few minutes or hours, whatever it is. And he's just going to go into a, a private place where there's no interruptions and he can just focus and he just cranks this out by hand in private. And then later it gets sent off to, you know, a church like Rome. But what I note is that uh, in the first century, it was very common for individuals to actually use scribes. So that is you would dictate a text to someone. And we know that uh, Paul did this because the name of his scribe is actually mentioned in uh, Romans chapter 16. His name is Tursus. And uh, so we actually find the allusion to him, but, or you might say properly the, the interjection there of, of Tursus. So you would have a scribe, someone like Paul's going to dictate a text to that individual, they're going to compose it. And that doesn't mean that Paul doesn't have any say in the style or the wording, because he surely would. In fact, if we look over all of Paul's letters, we see there is a discernible style and if you're familiar with the New Testament, you'll know that the style of Paul is very different than, say, the style of John. And the style of Luke is very different than the style of Matthew. So we see the individuals, uh, their own style uh, in the writings and uh, their own kind of method. But uh, also we find that, uh, that there were a number of people involved. So Paul would have dictated that to a scribe. And then at the end of the process, that individual is actually going to give the work to Paul. Paul's going to look over it. And uh, at the end of the process, once he is satisfied with the composition, then he's actually going to authenticate it. So he's actually going to sign his name at the bottom. And uh, those of you who have read uh, Paul's letters, you'll note they're at, in about six different epistles of Paul. At the very end, there's a reference to him writing in his own hand, uh, Philemon and Galatians and elsewhere. In fact, at the end of Galatians, he even draws attention to uh, his poor, well, not his poor eyesight, but he draws attention to the large letters which probably indicates that we have larger script uh, that was written there. And uh, so Paul's going to dictate that to a scribe, and then that's going to be uh, authenticated and then dispatched. So someone else is going to have to come in and actually take that letter where it needs to go and uh, deliver it, possibly read it to a public assembly, and then possibly come back and deliver a report to Paul about how the church received it. So there are a lot of people uh, involved. It's more of a team effort than a lot of people mm -hmm. might realize. So that, that's just a little bit as far as the uh, the composition goes. That's so good. I love it. I So I was trying to picture kind of like in modernity or modernity, <laughs> uh, yeah. like a few things that we do that we sometimes don't realize. Uh, we kind of like take it for granted, right? So for example, I can take a million pictures on my phone and if I run out of space... I just upload them to a cloud and I can have thousands and thousands, even millions of pictures you know, accumulated throughout my lifetime, right? Yeah. And I was thinking like when I grew up, the, the, the way a camera, and it's funny, you no, know, I mentioned cameras and we're not, <laughs> we're not talking <laughs> about cameras, uh, but anyways, uh, uh, I used to have a camera, right? And I studied communications and back in the days, it was all like film, like actual roles, with like 24 yeah. chances of taking a picture at a time, right? So every time you were going to take a picture, you made sure like, is this really like when I want to push the button and the shutter go in and have an image uh, impact the film, right? So you thought about it way more because it was kind of like out of not scarcity, but that's just how the system worked, right? You didn't have just like mm -hmm. limitless potential. So I was thinking of that and I thought... Man, how cool that the people that wrote the Bible, in a sense, right? Like, they they took such care and thoughtfulness uh, 
about writing that it was i mean one like you said it was a team effort it required mm -hmm. so many people involved because it was in a sense it was precious for them to like okay here's the writing i mean take care of this because as you pass it along it might get you no know, worn down and you know maybe it's scraped or maybe people <laughs> spill their their drink on it or something like that right so they treat it with with the proper care because it was so important right so i feel like that that was just like so awesome how you describe the process you know maybe like copying and yeah and and the 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 outer ship but also how people almost like put the stamp of approval on 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 a writing right so let's move on from that to a little bit of the the controversies around that and and i really want to kind of like in the middle of the episode move to like the nicene uh gathering and like all these people almost like ecumenical um mm -hmm. right like people coming from from maybe different even backgrounds coming together and saying okay let's agree on what's going to be the canon but before we get there you talk a little bit, a bit about this controversy of of I mean, you talk, for example, you mentioned the Da Vinci Code and things like that, that is super popular in, in today's, in modernity, I would yeah. say, right? So a little bit of those, um, like the passing of time and how did we get to like, uh, how did we get to like, like really saving these copies? Because I think at mm -hmm. some point, like we didn't really have so many copies and maybe the copies that we had weren't really the originals. So I think that's that's kind of like a controversy that can be helpful for people that are like, I just don't believe in this. You know, there's not enough copy. There's not enough original material. Right. Mm -hmm. But like I was saying, maybe the original material wasn't so important as much as having like the right copies. Right. So what do you have to say to the, like that? That part of the yeah. process? Well, there's uh, several controversies there that you mentioned. So I'll just try to walk through them, tie them all together here. But. Yeah, one of the key things you have to think about when you think about how the uh, origin came together, uh, I should say the New Testament came together, the origin of it, uh, what what actually prompted this, right? What actually started the whole process? What led mm. Christians to actually recognize some works and yes. to elevate them as authoritative scripture? And uh, there's, there's two basic kind of perspectives on this, and then different shades, different varieties of each of those two major perspectives. But one is there had to be something from the outside that was a threat to the church, so something extrinsic. And uh, a lot of times uh, when you think about the fourth century, when people allude to, say, the Da Vinci Code or, um, you know, the Council of Nicaea, what they're usually thinking of is the Arian controversy where there was a debate about Christology. I actually mentioned that a few minutes ago uh, with Arius, who is this presbyter in Alexandria, Egypt, and uh, he was a very polished, dynamic speaker, very charismatic, but he actually believed that Jesus was created, that he was not eternal. And so he started preaching this, And uh, but he was so popular. Everybody loved to go hear him speak. Uh, you know, just, we might call him today a celebrity pastor in Alexandria, right? So he was just a, just a really well-known individual. So people gravitated to this. And if it was someone else, maybe it would just pass into history. No one would have paid attention. But because of his popularity, this really became an issue. So this teaching began to spread around uh, throughout the Mediterranean world, and it ultimately led then, uh, after uh, after Constantine becomes a believer, at least uh, that's what history tells us, right? Uh, but he actually convenes a council at Nicaea, just a little bit outside of modern-day Istanbul. And so people came from far and wide. These uh, It was the first major, what you might call ecumenical council in the early church. There, there were many councils before that, but this is the the first major one that wasn't regional and that wasn't part of the uh, you know first generation like the Jerusalem Council Acts fifteen. So they all come and they they have this discussion about the nature of Jesus. So they reach this agreement that Jesus was not created; that he actually was divine; that he was the Son of God; he was the same substance as God the Father. He's not a lesser being. So the the idea is that that controversy sparked the creation of the canon. That what happened was the religious authorities of that day reached this agreement about Christology. Then they said, you know what, we're going to have more disagreements if we don't have a defined New Testament, right? So what we need to do is is really identify for once for all, you know, what is actually authoritative scripture. And so they would select the Gospels and Paul's epistles and things like that. What we have in our New Testament then is is them deciding what we should pick. So the argument is that the canon we have today is really the it's the it's the prize of the victors, right? 
Mm. Uh, we often say to the victors go the spoils. And so the idea is that it was these works were handpicked because they fit the theology of those who had power in that day. Well, mm. if that's the view you have, you're going to be a little skeptical of the New Testament. And a lot of people are for that reason. Mm. They think that uh, you know what we have in the New Testament is just one version of many uh, mm -hmm. from really Christianity. It's not what all Christians believe. It's just one particular tradition. And that's why there's such a push in many quarters to read a lot of other Gospels outside the New Testament, because the idea is, uh, if you really want to know who Jesus was, if you really want to know what the early church believed, you have to look outside the New Testament, because this is just one unique perspective then. So, mm -hmm. some think it was, uh, you know, Christological debates, 4th century. Others think maybe in the 2nd century, there's this heretic named Marcion, and they think that he may have had something to do with uh, prompting the, the origin of the canon, because... He had some views that were very out there, right, especially on the Old Testament. And uh, he was alleged to have started to circulate a small collection of writings. And that was uh, considered to be problematic for the greater church, for the greater authority, well, for the authoritative figures there in the church. So they, they selected a larger canon because they don't want this heretic Marcion to decide what people are reading. So those are what we might call extrinsic models. They they are based on the premise that something from the outside, some major threat to Christianity caused the leadership to select certain works as kind of a defense mechanism, right, mm -hmm. to make sure there weren't going to be more uh, controversies in the future. But as I explained in the book, I actually have a very different viewpoint on this. I don't think the canon was selected, you know, on one day by a particular group of people that are all kind of huddled around in discussion and, you know, with all kind of debate and that kind of thing. I actually think it's a very natural process, and uh, I think it all makes sense once we understand that the early church placed great emphasis on apostolic authorship. Mm -hmm. So that's not just one kind of uh, characteristic of many of the New Testament writings. It actually explains why they were reading these works in the first place. So early on, I mean, imagine if you were uh, in Rome and you received a letter from the Apostle Paul, you would want to read what it had to say, right? What he had to say. So you would take it seriously, and so. From the very time that these writings were produced, Paul's letters, Peter's, John's, the four Gospels, they were linked to the apostolic community. And so for that reason, they were recognized as authoritative instruction. I often tell my students, I, I think it helps to use this illustration. You know, if the Apostle Paul were to come on your podcast or if he were to uh, walk in my classroom and start to talk, we would all, you know, drop what we're doing and we would take every word he said seriously. And uh, we would recognize that he was commissioned by Christ as an eyewitness of the resurrection and uh, commissioned by Christ to proclaim the gospel, to establish the church. And so, therefore, we should take seriously what Paul says. So, we would do that if he was in person. And then if we wrote, we would also take seriously what he said. And that's what we have in the New Testament. So, these works were not, uh, like, discovered in, say, the fourth century. It's not as though someone was just kind of working through archives somewhere and they said, you know, this is actually from the Apostle Paul or you know, we, maybe we should read it now. So these are not just classics that were somehow discovered long after the fact and and uh, all of a sudden were elevated in importance. These are writings that from the very beginning began to circulate. They were used in public worship. In fact, we, we can actually read in the Church Fathers, second century, they tell us that when the Church gathered, they were actually reading the Gospels and the, the works of the Apostles alongside of Old Testament writings. So they're they're reading these as as though they're scripture very early on. So there was a natural impulse to uh, read and study, and uh, to recognize the authority of the apostolic writings. And so it didn't take then you know someone in the fourth century to decide what everybody should read, or some you know religious body to have a council and decide you know what's in and what's out. It was actually a very natural process. They just gravitated towards the apostolic writings. So if there was question about whether or not something should be recognized or not, it actually had to do most of the time with whether or not it was uh, of divine origin, or I should say of apostolic origin. Was it actually, could it actually be traced back to the apostles? And the early church was in agreement that the 27 we have are linked to the apostles either directly or indirectly. Everything outside the New Testament is not. So we actually don't have any work outside the New Testament that the early church believed actually had apostolic roots. Wow. Some of them are helpful, some of them maybe not so helpful. <clears throat> uh, they're all different, uh, and uh, Christians did read other works, but the church as a whole reached a consensus that the 27 we have are the works that do go back to the apostles. And again, those are the works that they were reading and studying from the very first century then.
Wow, that's that's so impressive. So how did that ch early church? So basically, what you're saying is, you know, the, Jesus comes, he starts having followers. They see him resurrect from the dead, and this become kind of like the the early apostles, right? So some of them mm -hmm. start writing, and these writings is what you're saying. You know, they they come from them, and you can trace them back to like those fo early followers of Jesus, and that's kind of like the the authority that the people when they they say let's let's make a canon. The canon it's based mm -hmm. on like this is this we can trace it back to Jesus. Versus there might be other writings like you're saying. Mm -hmm. There might be other writings which could be helpful, but we can't really trace those back to the early apostles, right? So that's kind of like what you're yeah. saying. And then from mm -hmm. there, um, it's it's just so interesting. Like at, at what point did those early followers of Jesus got kind of like. Uh, mingle or together with what we know now as like the the Roman Catholicism, right? Like, because I, I think, I mean, yeah. you've mentioned Constantine and he mm -hmm. says, now I'm a believer. And that's part of the controversy that you're saying that maybe he's the one that you know, kind of like out of him saying, you know, I have the power and control. I want a book that kind of like says, <laughs> you know, my authority <laughs> is valid type yeah. of thing. But at the same time, uh, uh I mean, that, that's kind of like a little bit even confusing for me. Like, how is that? Because I know, like, I have family who are Catholic and I know mm -hmm. their Bible has like a few different books, right? So mm -hmm. what was what was about like this group of people that came together? Uh, did they start like a couple different canons? And some of those canons are like the Roman Catholic canon. And there's, because, uh, you know, at some point I even want to get to like the, the Protestants, like, you know, in, ah. <laughs> later on. But but let's stay right there with, with this uh, early church creating mm -hmm. the canon, but maybe the possibility of, of similar canons, but not quite the same. And maybe, you no know, Armenians or, you know, Catholics and things like that. Like, like how did they know um, which books were going to be for who in a sense right yeah well actually uh protestants and catholics they do agree on the new testament canon right so there's mm. there's agreement on the 27 where there's dispute is about the the works many of the works that are are part of what we'd call the apocrypha right things like mm. first maccabees second maccabees uh sirach you know things like that so those were actually jewish writings that came before they actually were written between the old and new testament times um so they were they would they had actually uh, been around for many centuries uh before the new testament writers even wrote so that's actually more of an old testament um, issue than a new testament one so mm. the catholic church then does recognize these but it takes many many centuries it's not actually until the council of trent that there was some kind of official recognition of those uh, apocryphal writings and, and that council yeah, yeah and that council of trent is like years later after the no. the nicaea Council that oh, you yeah, mentioned? it's another 1200 years later. Yeah, okay. So, that's, so what you're saying that's is actually that... Reformation era. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. So the Council of Nicaea is that is that kind of like uh, a Roman church type of thing, or no? Like, was the basically what I'm asking, I guess, is yeah. did the Roman Catholic Church birth out of like this Nicaea Council, or was that already kind of like in the works? Uh, good. So, yeah, uh, Constantine the Great, he's the very first Christian emperor. And so that actually changed things quite a bit. So before him, you have people like Galerius, and he's persecuting the church and uh, putting many Christians in places like Thessalonica to death. I mean, just a very violent person, hated Christians. Um, and then uh, Constantine actually defeats him and other rivals because uh, for a while you actually they had this arrangement where you have two emperors and and uh, two caesars well that didn't work out very long <laughs> but mm -hmm. eventually constantine wins out and he becomes the sole dictator of the entire roman world and he recognized that uh religion has a unifying effect on an emperor an empire so you're not going to be able to have a unified roman world if they're fighting with each other over religious matters. And I, I think, I mean, some might disagree with me, but I think that Constantine saw Christianity as a way to unify the, the empire. Uh, he never actually rejected all of his Roman worship. He still worshiped the pagan gods throughout his lifetime, even after he was a believer or made a confession of faith. 
Wow. Uh, but but yeah, he. So you can say we want about the authenticity of his faith, but he becomes officially a Christian, right? Mm-hmm. Well, maybe I shouldn't even use the word officially because he wasn't actually baptized until uh, he died, uh, right, right before he passed away. Uh, but he sees Christianity as a uh, an opportunity to unify the empire, and so what he does is he starts to donate a lot of money. And this is why Christianity changes quite a bit in the fourth century. Mm. He starts to put bishops on the public payroll. He starts to fund huge cathedrals. And before this, you know, Christians were persecuted. They lived, uh, they had to be, they had to kind of put their head down at times and and uh, not create a lot of uh, attention for themselves. So they weren't always persecuted, but there were a lot of waves of persecution that happened in those first three centuries. So with Constantine now you have uh, someone at the top of the of the uh, of the hierarchy here, and he wants to make sure that there's no split within Christianity. So this is right around the time, as I said, that uh, Arius was starting to teach his views uh, about the nature of Jesus. So Constantine said, "No, we're not going to have this rift uh, between the Arian community and then the uh, those who have a more traditional view." So he actually convened this council to hammer this out. Um, so we know a good amount of what happened at that council, and we know that fundamentally what they were discussing was Christology. So this wasn't actually a discussion about uh, the New Testament at all. And that's mm-hmm. that's a point that I think a lot of people are surprised uh, to learn, wow. is they just have an impression, maybe because they read the Da Vinci Code or something, that it was at Nicaea that they actually determined. They had a you know maybe a vote on which books should be in or out. But we actually don't have anything like that. Uh, at all. Um, so no no historical evidence that they even discussed, you know, which books should belong to the canon. Instead, it was about Christology. And wow. uh, they all reached the agreement that, uh, you know, Christ is divine. And that's the same viewpoint that is reflected in the canonical works that we have today. Wow. But I would also just note that, yeah. you know, works like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they didn't just start to be read in the fourth century when this debate broke out. And, uh, you know, the leader said, okay, we're going to go with this view of Jesus, and here's here's four books we would recommend. But no, they they were reading those four books from the very beginning, what we call the fourfold gospel. So, it has ancient roots, goes way back, probably early second century, these four works are circulating as one single collection. So, wow. these works were not just kind of pulled out of thin air in the fourth century. They have a long history of use in the early church. Wow. Okay. So, it was uh, Constantine kind of like creating the Roman Catholic Church in a sense by establishing bishops you said and he could yeah i would say he laid the groundwork for it in many ways because once you get to the fourth century now christianity is much Mm -hmm. more connected so you didn't have any big council like this before the fourth century you have smaller regional gatherings but you don't have ecumenical counseling councils that had a lot of weight Mm -hmm. uh because everybody's just kind of you know one local church over here is they're very separate from churches over here and over here uh, but having a Christian emperor had a way of unifying the church. So oftentimes we'll re- we'll loosely refer to this as Christendom, right? Mm, this is yes. this one kind of Christian empire. Mm. And so that really does start, I would say, with uh, the Constantinian era. Wow. So at Nicaea, they're discussing really Christology. Is that where the, the, the creed of the apostles comes from? Because I, I think there's like a version called the Nicene Creed. Is that in this meeting or is that something else? Is it connected to this or no? Yeah, they're separate. So there's the Apostles' Creed, and then there's the Nicene Creed. And uh, yeah, like in the in the Eastern, like in Orthodoxy, they would actually affirm, uh, be much more supportive of the Nicene Creed. And we think about it, it, it makes sense because it was an ecumenical council that brought people from the East and the West together. Mm. And so it's much more of a of an ecumenical creed, right? It's it's more of a consensus of Christians from the entire Roman world rather than just, say, those in the West. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're very similar, actually, if you compare the two, but they have different historical roots. Wow, that's so cool. Okay, so we established that. Now let's move on a little bit to the, maybe the newer controversy, I would say. For okay. example, okay, so here in America, there was a, a person who found some, some scripture or writings, and then an entire religion was birthed out of mm-hmm. that right and and it, it's it's interesting because it's still connected somehow to like christianity and the roots of jesus and and things like that but i find that that happens quite often <laughs> you know where, where people even like you're saying you know the controversy back in the days with with um uh, what arian uh 
and Marcian, mm -hmm. right? Like these people who are like, hey, maybe there's these other writings we should be paying attention to. And I'm all up for people reading stuff, right? And things like that. I mean, I think we're here in America, especially we, I mean, you have a, a bookstore behind you and we love going to libraries and things like that. And books are massive, right? I mean, it's a big part of our culture. We love books and we love reading. But in this sense, you know, like how, how can we, do you ever see a future in which people are maybe coming together again and saying, you know what, these have been the books for a season, but we've been hearing about these other writings and these other writings and people claiming that these belong to God and they have divine uh, or divinity or divine input, right, or divine providence to them. Uh, and maybe a new council forms and they said, mm -hmm. you know, let's add to it. Do you ever see something like that happening? Has that ever, I mean, do, do you see any uh, in history, has that ever been attempted even or... What oh happened? yeah yeah good that's an interesting question yeah it's it's happened over the centuries for sure it happens all the time and and i would say it will continue to happen i don't think the the church as a whole will subscribe to any of the new proposals out there to accept new writings uh because the new testament writings we have are so entrenched in in uh in our worship and our history and again there's the recognition that they go back to the apostles so i don't think you can make a legitimate case today that you know we actually have one more that could go back to the apostles. That would be very, very difficult to uh, to make that uh, convincing to people. Um, so I don't think it will be convincing, but I think there's always going to be attempts. In fact, we can find this in the New Testament period, right? We can we can find uh, if you think about Jude and Second Peter, mm -hmm. they both reference false teachers. And one of the things that uh, like Jude will tell us is that the false teachers are dreamers, right? So they they have this idea that they have fresh revelation. It may not always be in written form. But one of the things we find about these false teachers is they believe that God has somehow spoken to them in an authoritative, unique way, and that this is legitimate uh, truth from God that everyone needs to accept. So that's that's often a mark of a false teacher, and find that even in the first century. Then when you go on, you see other examples of this. There was a group uh, called the Montanist in early Christianity, and and uh, Montanists actually believed that uh the whole that the holy well the, in the new testament we have references to this figure who would come named the called the paraclete right the helper and that's actually an allusion to the holy spirit and montanus began to associate himself with that and uh, he had a couple other prophetesses that uh, he was closely linked to and they believed that god was speaking directly through them and so they gained a following and and uh even some very famous people in christianity followed them but uh, but their movement died out eventually, right? Just why well, you don't have a, a Montanist church in every corner today, right? You don't hear about it much. So there's there's been attempts throughout the centuries to do that. And uh, you gave it a good example of an American uh, tradition that is based on this idea that God spoke supernaturally to one individual and gave him revelation that is authoritative in the same sense, maybe, as you know the New Testament writings. And uh, so I think that's what we have to be very careful about. Uh, but yeah, we're going to see more and more of that as we go um, mm -hmm. in our lifetime. I think we'll see attempts to of people to claim that they've received some kind of divine word from God. Uh, but uh, yeah, as, as far as authoritative scripture, I, I would say it's very, very difficult to make that case. Wow. Okay. So my big takeaway, I think so far, is that it, it's along the lines of theology is not just for an individual and even mm -hmm. scripture is not just for an individual and even the creating a canon needs that communal component to it right and people agreeing and even like you said ecumenical i mean people from from different backgrounds and even even maybe they had even their own opinions about the writings right mm -hmm. but they had to come to an agreement and i think that i mean that's so powerful just as humans to come together and say this is what it is right so, I mean, that's that's super cool. I love that part. And I would say maybe just on that uh, on that end of like new writings and teachings and people receiving from God that maybe divine message. Um, do you ever think, and I'm going to talk about like real quick about the, the Qumran findings, right? Because I think I heard the stories like in the... In the last century, right? The 19-somethings in the middle of the last century. They found... Um, scripture 
in um, in a cave in Israel mm-hmm. or in Qumran. And it's so interesting because, I mean, the findings they're finding there is like, oh, wow, this this date all the way back to, I don't know how many hundreds of years ago. So do you ever think we'll be able to find additional writings that are really old? So not just you know, people saying, claiming God speaking to them today, but yeah. like writings that are like even more a- ancient or really old that belong to the Jesus era that maybe talk even about Jesus is that, I mean, for sure that's a possibility, right? But, uh, what's Mm -hmm. your opinion on, on if something like that speaks, uh, maybe even differently about Jesus than what we know? Yeah. There, well, there's two basic types of uh, writings that maybe you, you're, you're thinking of here. One would just be copies, right? (laughs) So we've got lots and lots and lots of copies of the new Testament writing. So we're discovering new, writings every so often, new manuscripts as we call it, right? Mm -hmm. So we might find, for example, a new manuscript that has uh, the four Gospels in it, or maybe a portion of one of the Gospels, and we might find it tucked away in a library somewhere in Europe, or in the sands of Egypt somewhere. We may find a manuscript that has uh, biblical text on it. But that's that's not a new discovery of a new writing, it's just another uh, manuscript, it's another copy from the early church, right? So we're constantly finding those, and uh, then as far as new writings that uh, haven't been discovered, they, they don't tend to happen very often, right? So sometimes they do, but yeah, you made a, a good example there, offered a good example of some of these writings that we just discovered maybe in the last century. One would be something like the Gospel of Thomas or Judas. Um, we knew about these writings from some of the church fathers. They actually reference them and say some bad things about it, but we didn't have any actual copies of them to know what the content was. And some of these were discovered uh, just in the 1940s, especially. And uh, so we have very few copies of those today, but we now know, you know, what the content of it was based on those copies. But that that leads me to another point that I think is really interesting. You know, sometimes people will say, well, why should we not add, say, the Gospel of Thomas to the New Testament or the Gospel of Judas? Or, well, maybe not that one as a bad example, but maybe some <laughs> other some other Gospels, right? Thomas is often yeah. mentioned. Well, the reason why is because in the early church, they were not widely reading these. And there's a mm. there's a huge difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and any of these other Gospels that you may come across. The four Gospels, as I said, they were circulating in one collection. They were being read by Christians in the West and the East. You could go any corner of Christianity and say the 2nd and 3rd century, 4th century, they're reading these Gospels. They're very popular because they recognize that they go back to the apostolic community. But other writings that you may hear about today, these other Gospels, Gospel of Philip or Thomas, whatever it is, they're they're what you might call sectarian. Mm. So they're they're read by the folks who are more on the fringes of Christianity. So maybe Gnostic communities or something like that, but not uh, your typical church, not your typical gathering. So the fact that we had very few copies of these and some of these weren't even discovered until the 1940s, that just reminds us that these were not very popular in the early church. They were just read in isolated places and had a very limited uh, circulation in the early church. So that's a huge difference. So if you're going to go today and say, well, I think, you know, this gospel or that gospel should be part of the New Testament, then you've got to explain why the early church didn't have that opinion, right? Mm-hmm. So what is it about them that uh, you believe is authoritative? And uh, again, I would I would argue that uh, it's a very natural t- once we understand it's a very natural process once we understand this because they naturally gravitated to the apostles' writings. And that explains why they're reading them, but also explains why they considered them to be useful for Christians everywhere because the apostles were apostles for the whole the entire church, right? Not just for certain regions, and so they were reading them far and wide for that reason. So that's a huge difference I would say between the gospels we have in the New Testament and others that uh, you may hear about. Wow, that's so good and wonderful. And just to maybe summarize on my end, like the conversation of today, I think, and this is maybe just my personal opinion and perspective, but I think what I'm discovering is if there is an authoritative um, side of Scripture, uh, it comes from people agreeing on who Christ is. Right. So I, I think, I mean, to me, that was so important when you mentioned mm-hmm. Christology, because really, I think if you put it in, in today's day and age, our view of Christ is going to determine basically whether we, we, we can even open the scriptures or not. 
right? If we don't believe yeah, in Christ, yeah. then why would you even be reading the Bible, right? So, I mean, that that's so compelling right there. And I always say in my show, you know, I have like two tenets as far as my theology, you know, because I'm a media company, so not necessarily uh, a church or, mm. you know, like I need to have my statement of belief or something like that. But in a sense, I do have like two tenets that I say are um, God is good and Jesus is God. So even today's yeah. conversation, I feel like kind of like affirms at least for me that that opinion that I have, you know, but I'm always like super open to people having yeah. different opinions, you know, and people come in and say, and yeah. I don't agree. I had a person here on the show a few, a few shows ago, you know, where uh, she said, and she's a scholar and she talks, you know, she, she knows her stuff kind of like you, right? She reads and all of that and, and writes. And she said for some of the early, disciples or the early churches or the early movement i would say not not really churches but the early movement of jesus uh, she said jesus was not so important to them you know yeah. and, and i i agree with that but at the same time i feel like okay if jesus is not important to you then you're not following jesus right <laughs> you're following mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. else i mean it could be you can call it whatever else you want so to me i mean the the the, the christology and the christ-centric message of of the bible is just so essential you know if you're missing christ you're missing the whole thing uh that's my opinion right but anyways let's yeah. go to uh let's move on to our last segment of the show okay are you ready <laughs> here we go it's going to be the time for the emojis. Okay, so let's think about the future or summarizing the episode today. You're going to walk through the five emojis and the first one is blasphemous. So out of everything we talked, or out of everything you think the future will be, what is the most blasphemous idea, the, the most far-fetched from God that you can think of? Okay, so you're saying which uh, kind of false teaching do I think will be prevalent in the future? Oh, that'd be that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a good um, I, I think you can go back to many of the teachings in the early church, the false teachings in the early church. I think you'll see people deny the incarnation. You'll see people deny the divinity of Jesus. Wow, I think that's going to be more and more common. Sounds we find that actually in you know places like uh, Revelation, we find that uh, people set themselves up against Christ. Skeptical? What are you still skeptical of, or maybe where do you see skepticism playing out? Yeah, and I I think people are skeptical of, as we said earlier, any kind of authoritative individual any kind of body of writings that is presented as authoritative people are going to be very skeptical of that so i think that some of the things we talked about today are very very important right we don't want to just uh tell people the bible's authoritative we want to know why it is and that's one of the things i hope that uh we've uh discussed today and discussed in my book as well inspired emoji where did you see hope or what inspired you I see hope uh, in the church. I see hope in the the young generation. I get to teach a lot of college students. And so I see them as uh, being very thirsty for biblical knowledge. They want to serve the Lord. They want to know Him. Uh, they want to spend their life on something that actually is of eternal significance. So I'm hopeful just because there's a lot of people younger than me who are the remnant of the church, right? That, that, that are serving as that they want to serve as uh, as God's ambassador. So I'm hopeful for that reason. Love it. Holy emoji. So that's that's a holy idea. Can you think of something that you think it's holy? <laughs> ah, <laughs> well, I would say God's word is is holy, right? When God speaks, he's our authority. So what he says is pure and righteous and the scripture tells us it uh, he has given us everything that pertains to, to life and godliness and uh, so i think we need we are lacking maybe reverence for god and his character today and uh, hopefully our um, our lives will will emulate uh, what we believe about god and his character so good and lastly the divine emoji <laughs> <laughs> 
Benjamin, can you tell us the most divine idea you can think of? Ah, uh, that there is a God. I could just go to the nature of the gospel here, right? There is a God, and this holy God loves us, and he has given us his son as a offering for us, for our sins. And because of the offering of Jesus, because of the sacrifice that he made, sinners like both of us, right, everyone who's ever lived, we can all have peace with God through that sacrifice. My friends, there you have it. What an awesome conversation with Benjamin P. Laird on the authority of scripture. Highly recommend this book, Creating the Canon. You can check it out. Go visit us at christianpodcast.com. Please give us a positive review. Rate this episode five stars or more. And if not, don't rate it, please. <laughs> Move on to something <laughs> else. Uh, but Benjamin, where do you want to point people to if they want to find out more about who you are, your writings? Uh, where you teach and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I teach at Liberty University. You could always look up our webpage, Liberty University Divinity. You can look up the Divinity page there. If you want to know more about my writings, probably my Amazon page is probably the best place to go. Awesome. Thank you so much. What does the rest of your day look like? Oh, boy. Uh, grading papers, mowing grass, and uh, a few phone calls. Not yeah. as exciting as this, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right. <laughs>